Morgan, thank you so much for coming. I'm really pleased that you're here. And what we're going to talk about today is motor neuron disease. Um, motor neuron disease is a category of diseases. ALS is the most common of those. So we'll talk about that mostly. But there are also some other motor neuron diseases that I'm going to mention. There's primary lateral sclerosis, and there's progressive muscular atrophy. And although these are all motor neuron diseases, it's important to know which one you have because the diseases do act slightly differently. But let's first start talking about motor neuron disease in general. So, Motor neuron diseases are diseases of the motor nerves. Now there's a funny thing about when to say neuron and when to say nerve. And people wonder, when should I say neuron? When should I say nerve? And you have to have the secret handshake and go through the secret ceremony to, in order to find out when to say which. <laughs> so they are absolutely interchangeable and you won't be ever wrong just to say nerve. Okay, so don't worry about that. Um, but our nervous system is broken into a number of different families, so to speak, or trade unions. And just as a carpenter, a licensed carpenter, doesn't do electrician work and vice versa, a motor nerve does not do sensory nerve work. So we've got the sensory nervous system that has to do with sensation. The bringing feelings from the environment to you, hot, cold, sharp, dull, nummy, tingly, those kinds of things. And then we have, for instance, nerves of thinking and memory. When those go wrong, you might have Alzheimer's or another kind of cognitive problem. There are nerves for smoothness of movement, and when those go wrong, you might have Parkinson's, for instance. The autonomic nervous system takes care of automatic things like blood pressure, pulse, sweating, that kind of thing. <coughs> and the motor nerve, the motor nerves, they go from your brain out to your muscles and your brain tells your muscles how to move. So those are the nerves that have to do with movement. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the motor nerve system, okay? So let me draw a picture. Well, first let me say that ALS and motor neuron disease, um, it's a disease of the nerves and this affects the muscles. It is not a disease of the muscles per se, but the nerves are damaged and then it affects the muscles. So aiming therapy at muscles is not productive. It does not work because we have to aim therapy at the root cause, aim therapy at the nerves that are being damaged. And motor neuron disease falls into a category of neurodegenerative diseases. Neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases. Nerves are damaged, they degenerate, and then they die. Now some other neurodegenerative diseases that you might be very familiar with would be Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So it's thought that when you have a really wonderful breakthrough in any one of the neurodegenerative diseases that you might very well have, uh, it might very well have implications for another category of neurodegenerative diseases. So you'll see sometimes in the newspaper uh, a Parkinson's breakthrough and they say this might also be helpful for ALS. And so that's encouraging. And in fact, one of the drug trials that we're working on right now is with a Parkinson's drug that they've given a little twist to it and, and they think that that drug might very well be helpful for ALS. So the demographics of ALS. I'm just going to talk about ALS right now. But all of these diseases are really diseases of adults. 
So basically any person of adult age can get ALS. It's most common in people who are in their middle years. Um, and the middle years get older all the time as I get older, but uh, in any case, the middle years are... Yeah, from 30 to... No, it, actually it's, it's 55 uh -huh. to 60, but that's the peak. And it's, it's a bell curve. So... Doesn't a lot of 30-year-olds get it in the uh, after, uh, a lot of 30-year-old athletes? 30-year-old athletes? Yeah. We, that's, that's another interesting issue. Let me ans answer this one first. So, so 55 to 60 is kind of the top of the bell curve in terms of who gets it. And I've known people at 18. I've known people oh. at 90 or more. Um, there are people certainly in their 30s and 40s that get it. There is some preliminary evidence that if you have had an extremely athletic life, varsity sports, pro sports, or extreme athletics, that you <laughs> might be a little bit more predisposed. So we've got age here as a factor. And another environmental factor might be athleticism. There may be some other environmental factors. We think, perhaps, that the cause of ALS is related to genetics, not just one gene. And I'll, I'll talk about familial ALS in a minute or two. But for the sporadic kind, the kind that just happens. 90% of ALS just happens. For that kind, we know that uh, it's a bell curve like this, and we know that people who are younger rather than older when they get the disease, so people who are 45 or younger, compared to people who are 65 or older, generally speaking, the people who are younger when they get the disease, statistically, tend to do a little bit better. But I have seen plenty of people who are older who have lived long with this disease, and I've seen a number of younger people who have not had a long lifespan with this disease. So environmental factors can happen. And so one of the thoughts is that although we don't know why ALS happens, that it may be that there's a gene here and a gene there and a gene over here and a little glitch in a number of genes plus an environmental trigger. And we don't know what those triggers are right now. Does, does body fat have anything to do with this? Body fat, we we don't have any connection with body fat, but I will talk about nutrition when I talk about treatment. And I will talk about treatment. Um, so we think that with these glitches, there might be an environmental factor. And in fact, at California Pacific, excuse me, in fact, right now at um, University of California, San Francisco, they are doing a study on environmental factors where you go through a very long interview about where you lived uh, and what you did for a living and what you might have been exposed to, trying to find out if there is anything. And there are a number of centers around the world that are looking at that, trying to find a clue as to why this disease happens. So we don't know why it happens. We certainly know it does happen. And if there are environmental triggers, what are those? One of the things I want to mention right now is um, the issue with veterans. If you were a veteran in the Gulf War, you, have, you are twice as likely to get ALS than someone in the general population. If you were a veteran of any time period, you are one and a half times as likely to get ALS as people in the general population. So we don't know why veterans are more likely, but the Department 
more, li more likely to uh, get ALS. But the Department of Defense is putting a lot of money into several studies looking at that. Right. So again, talking about who gets ALS, um, the question that triggered me starting on this was uh, men versus women. So for every for every um, 10 women that get the disease, about 15 men get it. So it's about 1.5 to 1. So it is more predominant in men than it is in, than it is in women, and we don't understand why. And there's a blip with older women, women who are postmenopausal. There are more postmenopausal women who get it compared to women before they stop having their menstrual periods. Again, we don't know why. But that gives you some of the demographics. And then how many people per year? About 5,000 new cases per year in the United States. No, it's not too many. And about 30,000 people in the United States living with this disease at any given time. If you oversimplify how movement happens, grossly oversimplify it, you can break it down to four steps. And let's pretend that this is a brain. That's a brain stem, the piece between your brain and your spinal cord, okay? And this is a muscle out here with lots of muscle fibers in it. If I want to take a drink from this bottle here, what happens? Number one, I think a thought. And that thought turns into a plan. So I think a thought turns into a plan, number one. Number two, that plan gets picked up in the motor area of the brain by nerve cells that have short or long tails. Now I'm going to diverge for just a second and draw you a nerve. And we usually draw it as kind of a diamond-shaped cartoon with a tail and then lots of branches at the end. This again is oversimplified. So this is the cell body. This is the axon. And these are the branches at the end. And another word for end, like the end of the train, uh, line or the bus line is terminal, so terminal branches. So what happens with a nerve is it takes in some information from outside, it processes that information, the information goes down the axon, and it goes out the branches at the end to the next place where that message is supposed to go. So all of our, our motor nerves work like this. And you can think of this as an electrical system. It's a, it's a system of positive and negative charges. And um, just like an electrical system, you need wires. And you can think of the axon as being an extension cord. Some of the extension cords are short. Some of them are very long. Okay. So now back to our picture over here. So we've drawn these nerves in the motor area of the brain and they're going down the spinal cord. Some of them are short and they're going to stop in the brain stem. Now another word, an old word for the brain stem is the bulb. Because when physicians were first looking into people, you know, way back, you know, 100, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, they were first opening up people to see, you know, what does it look like in there? They looked at this area at beneath the brain and above the spinal cord and they said, looks like a bulb. We don't know what it does, but it looks like a bulb. We'll call it the bulb. We'll figure out what it does later. So it looked like a bulb, an onion bulb or a tulip bulb, that kind of thing. So, 
So they called it the bulb, and the nerves that come out of that area, the motor nerves that come out of that area are called the bulbar nerves, and they go to the bulbar muscles. The bulbar muscles are the muscles of chewing, swallowing, and speech. So if someone starts with problems in chewing, swallowing, speech, they say that they have bulbar onset ALS. The onset of the ALS was in the bulbar region. And about 25% of people start in the bulbar region, and about 33% of people start in the arms, 33% in the legs, and then the rest in other areas. So you can see that most people have limb onset ALS. 66% of people have limb onset, starts in either one arm or one leg, that kind of thing. Other would be in the trunk, the big muscles that hold us erect. Um, could be with the breathing muscles, in particular the diaphragm, the big muscle that goes from front to back and helps our, our lungs to move. Okay, now I've diverged. Let's go back to our one, two, three, four steps on how movement happens. So, I think a thought, I turn that thought into a plan. And then that plan is transferred to the upper motor nerves or the upper motor neurons. So they pick up that plan. They process that plan. They send the plan down. If the plan is that I'm going to pick this up and take a drink, the upper motor neurons that go way down to talk to the legs, they won't be activated in this. It's only the nerves that are needed for the job that get activated. So, <coughs> so if you have upper motor nerves, then of course you're going to have what? Lower motor nerves. And those start either in the brain stem and go out, as I said before, to the muscles of chewing, swallowing, speech. Um, or they start in the spinal cord, and they're all along the spinal cord, and they will go out to the muscles, where their branches will talk to individual muscle fibers. So, now we're at the muscles. This was number three. The lower motor neurons start in the spinal cord or the brainstem, go out to the muscles. We're at four now with muscles. The muscles get the message, and what do they do? Action takes place. So I think a thought. That thought turns into a plan. Gets caught up in the brain, in the upper motor nerves, goes down to the appropriate lower motor nerves, the appropriate muscles get activated, and action happens that I can take my drink. What is involved in ALS? What muscles could potentially be involved? Any voluntary muscle has the potential to become weak in ALS. And the voluntary muscles are those muscles that you control. So first of all, let's think of the, of a muscle that you can't control. I always quiz people. So a muscle that moves, moves all the time, but you don't have any control over it. Can you think of what that might be? Your heart muscle. Your heart muscle, excellent, right. So your heart has a different electrical system that controls it compared to your arms and your legs. The other muscle group that is involuntary is your gut. Okay, you cannot make things go faster or th slower through your gut. It de depends on other things, and so it has a different electrical system. So think about those muscles that you can move. You can furrow your brow. Some people can wiggle their ears. I can't. Facial expression. You can blink your eyes, move your eyes back and forth, up and down, um, speak, swallow. Big muscles in your neck to hold up your head, which is very heavy. 
Your arms and your legs, of course, are quite obvious of what they do. Big muscles in the trunk to hold you erect. Abdominal muscles to make you look pretty, also to help with bowel movements. And the muscles of respiration, which in this particular disease are the most important muscles because it is the muscles of respiration that when they no longer work, it does become incompatible with life. But we have lots of ways to support that along the way. So we'll talk about that too. So for some reasons that we don't understand, some muscles are more or less protected and do not become affected. So the muscles of the eyes, blink and extraocular movements up down to the side either become affected very very late or don't become affected at all for a lot of people and then the muscles that you learned to control when you were two for the men maybe three they're a little slower on this but the external sphincters bowel and bladder control rarely become affected and I think that's very comforting to know that you don't become incontinent with this disease. Um, now, does everybody get weak in all areas? The answer is no. Everything you read will tell you that you get weak everywhere. But not everybody does. It depends on what order the different areas got affected. So if your legs get affected first, you're likely, yes, to lose your ability to move your legs completely. For some reason that we don't understand, quite often the respiratory muscles are the last to become affected. And so those people do lose the ability to move their legs, their arms, speech, and swallow before they pass away from this disease. But let's say your respiratory system got involved before your bulbar muscles. I know of a number of people that have never had significant weakness of chewing, swallowing, or speech. They might have some, but they pass away from the disease without losing that ability completely. Some people do not lose the ability to walk completely. They might have some changes, but not so much that requires a wheelchair. So everybody's a little different. You can't look at one ALS patient and say, that's what's going to happen to me. Everybody's different with this disease. So what's, we talked about what might go wrong. Um, and you can imagine with the loss of, of strength in an arm, you're going to have lots of problems with that. Ability to write, ability to feed yourself, those kinds of things. So I'll just talk about the muscles in general and not everything that's associated with that right now, but what stays normal? So sensation, for the most part, stays normal. Feeling of hot, cold, sharp, dull stays normal. The autonomic system, for the most part, in, in most people, is absolutely normal, although some small numbers of people will have uh, sweats or might have changes in their blood pressure, those kinds of things. Uh, that's a new area of research interest is how many people have involvement of the autonomic nervous system. We think it might be maybe up, up to 10% or so, and the other 90%, the autonomic nervous system stays normal. Bowel and bladder function stays normal, except what I'm going to talk about when I talk about symptoms in just a minute. The special senses remain normal. So eyesight, taste, touch, hearing, those things stay normal. And sexual function. So mostly the ability of a man to get an erection that uh, I think that many men will understand is involuntary and not a voluntary muscle movement. And that is a different electrical system that controls that. So sexual function stays normal. 